Good evening. I'm Lenithia Matthew Schultz. I'm professor and chair of political science at Muhlenberg College. Welcome to our program, The International Crisis in Ukraine, How and Why It Matters. It is the sixth day of war in Ukraine. And this discussion is of such critical importance. And we know that many folks have questions that they're interested in contributing to the discussion. So we want to get things started as quickly as possible. So to begin, I just wanted to review a few housekeeping matters. This uh, session is being recorded and will be available starting tomorrow um, on our website. I just enabled the live transcript uh, captioning. So if you're interested in captioning, you can turn that on by clicking on live transcript on the bottom right uh, side of your screen. Throughout the duration of our program, attendees in the audience are encouraged to submit questions using the chat function. I will take note of all questions that are submitted and do my very best to make sure that the topics that interest you are covered in our discussion. We have a large and growing audience. We're um, over 375 folks um, in attendance already, and that number is just growing <laughs> every second. So I just want to offer my apologies in advance if we don't have an opportunity to address all of your questions. I'd like to welcome and briefly introduce our panelists, um, our guests this evening, who will be offering opening remarks um, in this order. Dr. Mohsen Hashim is Muhlenberg College Professor of Political Science, Director of the Russian Studies Program, and Director of the Dana Scholars Program. Dr. Hashim's research focuses primarily on post-Soviet Russian political and economic transitions and Russian foreign policy and geostrategic calculus. Dr. Julie Schultz is a visiting lecturer in German and Women's and Gender Studies. Her research interests include women and socialism and German modernism and expressionism. Dr. Schultz's co-edited volume on women in German expressionism is forthcoming with the University of Michigan Press. Congratulations about that, Julie. Um, some of her current projects focus on the intersections of gender and violence in World War I, World War II, and the German Democratic Republic. Lauren C. Anderson is a distinguished graduate of Muhlenberg College, and she recently joined our Board of Trustees. She is a former FBI executive with national security expertise. She led counterintelligence and espionage investigations, including those focused on Russia and the former Soviet Union. And she currently serves as a non-resident fellow with the Geneva Center for Security Policy and as an advisor and special skilled role player for the US military. And finally, Dr. Brian Mello is professor of political science and director of Muhlenberg Center for Ethics. Dr. Mello's research focuses on the intersections of comparative politics and political theory and includes analysis of contemporary Turkish politics. He teaches courses on government and politics in the Middle East, Islamist radicalism as ideology and political practice, government and politics in Europe, conflict and peace studies, and comparative social movements. Welcome to all four of our panelists this evening. I'm just as anxious as you are to hear from them. And so with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Hashim uh, to begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I was talking to a few of my students in my Russian politics class and students in my other courses. They, they asked me to give a broader historical context so they can understand um, uh, how and why this is happening. So I won't go back to Kiev and Rus um, and at the birth of the Russian state and the, the church. I'll start with the Soviet collapse and uh, the uh, Russian concerns about the post-Cold War security structure, the roots of resentment uh, after the um, Cold War ended, and how these Russian grievances uh, led to a consensus within the national security establishment about how to deal with the West and how to aspire uh, as a geopolitical force. And that consensus happened not in the Putin administration, as we often think, but in the Yeltsin administration. And that leads us to this notion of the politics of near abroad, how to operate in the former Soviet space. And then I'll talk about Putin, uh, how he has been acting, given all the options that he had, the menu of manipulation that he had, what I consider for on his part to be this irrational move, move to this attack. And I did not anticipate it, I'll be the first to admit. So I'll start with two quotes, one from before the Cold War started um, officially, so 
It is by Winston Churchill in 1939, who said the famous Russia quote that many people know. I cannot foreca forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but perhaps there is a key. That key is Russian national interest. Remember, this is before the beginning of the Cold War. The second quote is after the end of the Cold War. And that's from by George Kennan, the architect of our containment policy, who wrote in 1997 in a New York Times op-ed, um, and I'm quoting, uh, expanding NATO would be the most fateful error of American foreign policy in the entire post-Cold War era. Such a decision may ex uh, be expected to inflame the nationalistic, anti-Western, and militaristic tendencies in Russian opinion to have an adverse effect on the development of Russian democracy to restore the atmosphere of the Cold War to East-West uh, relations and to impel Russian foreign policy in directions decidedly not to our liking, end quote. And the new issue of foreign policy just has a piece by Ivo Dalder, which is the return of the Cold War or the new Cold War. So we need a little bit of historical context. How did we get here? It was Putin didn't just pull it out of thin air. So the Soviet collapse led to Russia's loss of great power status in, sp in spite of its enduring great power uh, ambitions. We know that. Richard Sakwa uh, refers to this as an asymmetric end, the Cold War that failed to create a mutually acceptable European security system from a Russian perspective. Russia's loss of satellite republics uh, and the states and the former Soviet uh, republics allowed for Western gains in terms of NATO expansion and the EU expansion eastward that we all know full well. Russia basically lost control over 110,000 square kilometers of territory. Uh, second place Cold, Cold War didn't bring about a consolation price. So it's really important to consider the Russian reading, reading of such uh, reversal of its geopolitical fortunes. Gorbachev, who started the process of detente and that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, we often think about his policies of glasnost and perestroika, but in international relations, it was his policy or framing called new thinking. And this new thinking called for a new and more encompassing and inclusive uh, security structure that would rely on institutions such as the OSCE um, to promote multilateralism. In place of Euro-Atlanticism, Gorbachev's notion of a common European home and greater Europe called for a multipolar continent united in systemic and ideological diversity. Clearly, it was an aspiration of this. Russia felt that it deserved to be accorded the status of an equal partner uh, in a restructured European security system, especially given uh, since, since Gorbachev's new thinking allowed for the reunification of Germany, and he also ended the Brezhnev doctrine. Uh, so from the Russian perspective, Russia's regional and global security concerns and interests were disregarded as the country was accorded a second-class status of a defeated power. NATO and EU expansion kind of reified Russian distrust of US or American hegemony, and intensified a sense of Russian humiliation that was born out of what it called unilateral concessions. I often remember a, a title of a short novel, a short, a short story by Dostoevsky that was titled The Insulted and the Humiliated. And that resentment and imperial nostalgia keeps coming back, especially in Putin's uh, current actions. We often rush um, to, to Putin immediately when thinking about Russian apprehension and Russian aggression. But this is where I say it's important to pause and remember that disenchantment with the West grew before Putin. And it led to an assertive national security posture, even within the Yeltsin administration and his national security establishment. And Yeltsin was supposed to be uh, the, that, that person, that an, newly minted anti-communist who would take Russia to the West, uh, embrace markets and democracy. Uh, and, and, and clearly that didn't out. So the so-called pro-Western Yeltsin and his pro-Western, again, quote unquote pro-Western foreign minister, Andrei Kozarov, they laid the groundwork for Russia's renewed geopolitical am ambitions that, in hegemonic terms. In mid-1993, Yeltsin spoke about Russia's intention of maintaining a military presence in Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, and Central Asia. His foreign minister, the pro-Western guy, uh, darling of the West, up until, uh, up until a point, 
stated that Russia would cease to listen to the West's lectures as it viewed the former Soviet Union and I quote, as a zone of special responsibility and special interest. It has prerogatives there. So unlike the post-war German and Japanese elites, the Russian leaders continue to imagine Russia as a great power with legitimate global ambitions, in spite of the country's emaciated military and economic capabilities. As far as the back in 1993, Kozarev again declared at the UN General Assembly, and I quote, Russia realizes that no international organization or group of states can replace our peacekeeping efforts in this specific post-Soviet space, unquote. Same Kozirev also mentioned that Russia may consider the use of force to defend its interest and welfare of Russians living in the near abroad in the former Soviet space, that is. In his 1994 New Year's address to the nation, Yeltsin appealed to the Russian diaspora as compatriots. Uh, compatriots. The Russian word is called satejistvennik. Declaring that, and I quote, you are inseparable from us and we are inseparable for, for, from you. We will we were and will always be together, unquote. Yeltsin then uh, uh, admonishes uh, our ambassador at large, uh, Deputy uh, Secretary of State Strobe Talbot uh, during the Clinton era in 1996. I'm quoting Yeltsin now. I don't like it when the US flaunts its superiority. Russia's difficulties are only temporary and not only because we have nuclear weapons, but because, also because of our economy, our culture, our spiritual strength. All that amounts to a legitimate, undeniable basis for equal treatment. Russia will rise again. I repeat, Russia will rise again. And this is a enfeebled Yeltsin who is making a hash of things in the, in the political realm, in the economic realm, Russia is tanking, but he has these aspirations. So only on the backdrop of these developments do we have to consider Putin when he came to the foreground in 2000, he saved Russia from implosion. You know, he centralized power, brings in the security structures, the civil vikis, uh, and doesn't pretend to be a Western kind of puppet or doesn't even try to emulate our democracy. He has his own notion of sovereign democracy, managed democracy, which is not a democratic country. So there are national security doctrines that are building in a seamless fashion that is asserting Russia's uh, own vision of uh, its uh, uh, civilizational identity and geopolitical claims. So I'll fast forward a little bit. In 2012, uh, Putin defended Russia's so-called, um, or as he said it, independence and sovereignty in spiritual, ideological, and foreign policy spheres. And that defense, the national security doctrine says, is an integral part of our national character, and we have to uh, do this. He depicted ethnic Russians as the core that binds the fabric of Russia as a culture and a state. The Russian word for court, for those of you that know Russian is Persian. Uh, he called for the strengthening of institutions that are the carriers of traditional values. That includes the Russian Orthodox Church. That is deemed as one of those carriers of traditional uh, values. He has also been on rant of uh, calling us degenerates, you know, decay of, and he's the last bastion or custodian of Christendom, right? It's very convenient. And the Orthodox Church has played along with it, right? Because it enhances its value there. Um, the stress, uh, stress on Russianness and Russian values helped establish the Kremlin narrative that Russia's borders do not coincide with Russia's sphere of identity. So that sphere is beyond its borders. Uh, the former Soviet space where many ethnic Russians reside, and we talk about the Donbas region, and we recently talked about Crimea, uh, it's deemed as Russia's sphere of identity. The argument contends that Russia is the only force that can intervene in this space to protect its compactness or its satechistinity. The 2021 national security strategy talks about Western hegemony in the face of US decline being a destabilizing force that undermines Russian sovereignty, values, and cultural and moral specificity. Presenting then Russia as a state civilization with blurred national boundaries serves as a legitimation for attempts to reintegrate this post-Soviet space. So that's a kind of a background. So notions in Russian history from pre-Soviet times, there were terms called derjava, that is great power. So derjavnost is an adjective that keeps coming up in Putin's rhetoric. 
and a strong centralized state. Russia is too vast. A centralized ruler is the only way. And that's where the word государственность from the word state. So great powerness and stateness are central things. He's drawing from history. And, and it's, it's, it's something that's going on. So Russia witnessed not only NATO expansion and EU expansion, other losses that in its cultural identity and ideational spheres, the NATO bombings of Serbia, Never mind that Milosevic was actually carrying out genocide, right? But they felt they were helpless. That's their narrative that I'm going over. Then the colored revolutions, you know, in the former Soviet space, whether it's Georgia, Ukraine, and all that, they, the narrative there is it's being orchestrated, if not by Hillary Clinton herself, but by the Western. It has some traction, doesn't matter what we think, right? Um, all the way to the 2011 protests after the elections, the Duma elections, the Belotnaya Square protests in the middle of a Rus uh, Russian uh, uh, winter. Um, and that generated, led to the 2014 annexation. I mean, that was a place where predominantly Russians lived, easy to have a referendum, and then you just took it over. And the sanctions were weak. We could withstand them. That is the West coming in. Same with Abkhazia, South Ossetia when he tried Russian incursions into Georgian space, right? So he's been building on this. Then of course, 2014, after the Crimea and the annexation, Yanukovych escapes, flees, unlike Zelensky, who didn't need a ride from us, decided to stay behind. Uh, but there was the Euromaidan. Again, it's getting closer and it's getting nervous. Throughout this time, he's played, you know, leveraged energy politics, pipeline politics, to make sure Ukraine freezes, the threat of European Union's dependent on that, uh, on gas and, and oil. These are some of the things that are important for us to understand. But what surprises me is why I didn't see this coming. In his many, many of manipulation, he had so many things that went in his favor. In, in Ukraine, he has a substantial Russian population in the Donetsk and Luhansk region. We brokered an arrangement, the Minsk agreements, where we said Kiev needs to talk to that, those people's republics and grant them some kind of a autonomy. So he could have had an old Finlandization of neutrality of um, uh, Ukraine in many, many ways. Uh, somebody just wrote no sound, but I think it's at their end, I'm not sure. Um, but so he could have played with disinformation, the hybrid warfare was going very well. We are polarized, we are weak. What he did ended up uniting us at a superficial level. The underlying conditions haven't quite been there. He could have played with notions of, you know, American hegemony, played up the Iraq invasion, which undermined our credibility on interference and non-interference in other countries' uh, sovereignty. He had a lot of ways to ensure that Russian speaking populations in Ukraine and regions would have veto powers over Ukraine's future. And let's not forget, Ukraine didn't meet any of the requirements of joining EU. It's, it's nowhere near. It's really a poorly governed country, whether the liberals ruled it or the Moscow students ruled it. It's way behind on every metrics, nowhere near NATO admission or all that. And all the levers were there. And why he did this, it's a puzzle. And I will leave that. Uh, for the Q&A. A few more quotes from, because we have to bring in Putin, right? So of course you all know about his 2005 pronouncement about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the greatest geopolitical uh, catastrophe of the 20th century. But I think what's more important is what led him to say in the recent two speeches, um, Ukraine never had a tradition of genuine statehood, basically not a country, uh, and actually blaming the Bolsheviks to create Ukraine, right, in a way that that was something that was important. Um, he says, modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia, more precisely the Bolshevik communist Russia. This process began immediately after the revolution. But some of the things that are important to understand that things that happened since 2014, right, Russia feels that they were not getting any traction on the Donbas region. Instead, Ukrainian nationalists were asserting control over their sovereign territory. That is their prerogative, but how Russia was interpreting it. Some of the more recent things that really irked Putin was his ally, the oligarch Viktor Medvedchuk, a media tycoon and a tycoon. Uh, his media empire was shut down last year. 
he was placed under house arrest. His assets were frozen. Uh, and, and after that, when the 2021 language law came into practice, that Ukraine being the prime language in the service sector and everywhere else, uh, then the whole Russianness, and that's when the term fascists and Nazis came to the forefront. But even then, this is, I'm not denying there are extreme right forces in Ukraine, just like there are here or in Russia. Uh, you know, the groups like Svoboda and people like Dimitro Yarosh, they frankly scare me, the Azov Battalion, right? Uh, they'll go after just about anybody. But this is Slavic people. This is not bombing Grozny or Aleppo. And so this made very little sense when he's supposed to be the bearer of a civilization. He is going after his own people. So that opens, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I've gone probably gone way over my time, but I'm very happy to participate in Q&A. I think it's Julie. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you, Mohsen. Um, I want to thank my, my colleagues in political science for including me in this important discussion tonight. And um, it's a time of so much uncertainty right now. And um, this past week, every night after both kids went to sleep, I sat down at my computer to read about the events of the day and think about what remarks I might make. And every the next day, I would sit down to, to work and toss out what I had the night before because things have been changing so quickly and there's so much to keep up with. So. Um, so I will use this time here to briefly comment on my observations through my lens as someone in German studies and, and my women's and gender studies as well. Um, so first I'll share a few thoughts, particularly about German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's speech and the Bundestag this past weekend. And then I wanna reflect briefly on my work with my students this week because it connects to these global issues and about my work in general coming from languages, literatures and cultures. Um, so first, a little bit about Germany's role here. Um, so while Olaf Scholz has had a long career in politics and was previously vice chancellor and federal minister of finance, he is only a few months into his role as chancellor. And this is on the heels of 16 years of Angela Merkel's steady leadership. So as I listened to his speech the other day, it was punctuated by lots of applause, cheering, some surprise murmuring as well, as he made several decisive statements. Um, so noting that this Russian invasion of Ukraine constitutes a turning point, he made several important announcements that speak to the magnitude of this situation. Um, Germany has a long-standing principle in the aftermath of World War II of not sending or selling weapons to conflict zones and also not authorizing weapons made in Germany to be sold to other countries um, either. Um, but this aggression threatens the entire post-war post order and Germany will be sending weapons to Ukraine and some restrictions on third-party delivery of weapons have also been eased as well. Um, so Schultz has also authorized an increase in funding to support the Bundeswehr, or army, with an investment of 100 billion euros this year, which is also um, a big development. He emphasized that the terms have changed because there's war in Europe, Putin's war, as he insisted. Um, and also, even traditionally neut neutral Switzerland has adopted the sanctions imposed by the EU on Russia, as well as other financial sanctions, and has closed its airspace to most Russian aircraft, referring this to as an extraordinary situation in need of extraordinary measures. Um, so these are some of the big shifts we see. Also, a week ago, Germany put a halt on the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which um, was to be a major supplier of natural gas from Russia, playing a role in Germany's energy venda as it transitions away from coal and nuclear power to focus on more environmentally sound sources and policies. Um, so there was talk leading up to this decision as to whether or not Germany would make this decisive move since natural gas prices are going up and will continue to rise with this action. Um, but this type of infrastructure project shows that these projects are more than just about business and economics of energy. These are really, you know, they have geopolitical repercussions and they can be weaponized during these tensions and conflicts. Um, so those are some thoughts on what's happening in Germany um, now. But uh, my next set of comments is thinking about refugees. And as I was con considering what I could contribute this evening, I thought I would draw on my current unit in my intermediate German course, where we're talking about multiculturalism in the German speaking world. And we're discussing various long term impacts of German colonization, war and the aftermath of war and how we see this. This week, we're looking at a uh, recent re we're looking at recent refugee experiences. And we're reading a book called Neben mir ist noch Platz, or next to me, there's still room, or there's, there's a space next to me. 
Um, it's by Paul Marr. And the version we are reading is from 2016, and it draws on the 2015 wave of Syrian refugees fleeing war. It's meant as a book for children and young people, and it tells the story of a friendship between Aisha, a Syrian refugee, and her German classmate Steffi. They navigate cultural misunderstandings and hurt feelings sometimes as they learn about each other's customs, such as eating habits and gender roles in the family. And when Aisha is absent from school, Steffi goes to check on her and finds that the refugee home has been attacked and Aisha's younger sister was injured by broken glass from a shattered window. Aisha's family wonders if they should be more scared of life here than in Syria. And she asks Steffi, warum mögt ihr uns nicht? Haben wir euch was getan? So why don't you like us? Did we do something to you? And Aisha's use of ihr or you all here groups Steffi in with her German compatriots. Steffi blames the violence on Ein paar Spinner, a few crazy people, and Aisha responds, Und warum hat uns dann keiner geholfen? Well, and why didn't anyone help us then? When Aisha likens this violence against refugees to war, Steffi becomes defensive and insists that Aisha is exaggerating. The friends eventually reconcile when Aisha learns that her family is moving to a new town since they have no control over where they live as asylum seekers. Shortly after Aisha leaves, a new student, Naima, joins Steffi's class and needs a place to sit. She is also a refugee, and while their, cl their classmates glance around uncomfortably and avoid eye contact, Steffi volunteers, neben mir ist noch Platz. There's a seat next to her for Naima. Steffi has learned the importance of welcoming refugees in Germany and helping them to navigate their new and potentially precarious or temporary home. So interestingly, this is the second iteration of the book as an earlier version focused on refugees from Lebanon. Mar updated the story for the current context. And in each instance, he pointed to the perpetuation of violence against refugees and asylum seekers in Germany. In the first version, Aisha's home is set on fire and the family decided to return to Lebanon in the face of this violence. Unfortunately, some read it as a solution. If you want refugees to leave, use violence. In recent years, we see continued, um, we continue to see such violence against um, refugees and asylum seekers in Germany, from, from verbal insults and harassment to arson and bodily harm. And these instances are often designated as politically motivated right wing crimes. And there were more than 1600 attacks on refugees and refugee shelters in 2020. Refugee organizations and volunteers are targeted at, at times as well. So language can also perpetuate violence and is used to perpetuate notions of desirable versus undesirable immigrants, of temporality, temporality, of belonging and not belonging. And this brings me to the situation unfolding as hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians flee the violence and conflict in their country. Many are heading to countries such as Poland, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and Moldova, though Central Europe is not quite equipped to deal with these numbers. Many will be moving on to other European Union countries, including Germany and Austria, where the train companies have already promised free fare for those refugees with a Ukrainian passport or identity card. Uh, many EU countries are prepared to welcome and host these refugees, and this stands in stark contrast to other recent instances, such as Poland's prior response of util utilizing troops and constructing a wall to repel predominantly Muslim asylum seekers, largely from the Middle East and Afghanistan, at the borders with Belarus. And Hungary has also passed laws criminal criminalizing support for asylum seekers and limiting right to asylum. And Poland and Hungary are now welcoming Ukrainian refugees. So these Ukrainian refugees are largely white, European, majority Christian. They have a legal right to enter Poland and other EU countries without visas. And these circumstances are, um, have been different for refugees coming from the Middle East and Africa in recent years. Um, so we also see that racism and Islamophobia are apparent in the language being used. So for instance, Bulgaria's prime minister um, speaking about Ukrainian refugees to journalists stated, these are not the refugees we are used to. These people are Europeans. These people are intelligent. They are educated people. This is not the refugee wave we have been used to. People we are not, we were not sure about their identity. People with unclear pasts who could have been terrorists. So this is not to imply that the same restrictions and scrutiny should be now applying to the Ukrainians seeking safety, but rather it makes us think about the, uh, to consider the double standards and issues of racism that are embedded in these European migration policies. Um, and also um, thinking about questions of margin marginalization and mobility or lack of mobility in times of conflict. Um, there's opposition to migration at times based in nationalist beliefs or a desire to preserve a cultural or, or a national identity. Um, 
Also, I've, I've been reading reports of non-white residents of Ukraine, including Africans who are studying and working in Ukraine, being stopped at the Polish border and not allowed to cross, though these reports are being denied by officials and border patrols. Um, Nigerians are the second largest group of foreign students in Ukraine, and the Nigerian government has not offered support or assistance. And just this morning, I saw a post by the Each One Teach One organization in Berlin sharing information about a Black community group in Hamburg where they're organizing transportation to the Polish border so that they can help transport these refugees to Berlin. Um, they point out in their message that these international students and workers contribute to the economy in Ukraine, but are not valued or protected in the same way as evidenced by their treatment right now in trying to escape the danger. Um, and finally, just a couple of quick questions of language. Um, coming from a languages, literatures, and cultures department, language is always on my mind when we're discussing these situations. Um, and that leads to issues since, such as the politics of naming in terms of cities and places um, being used in the reports and discussions, right? Are we using um, the Ukrainian or the Russian terms? Um, it's a sign of respect for the Ukrainian language and identity or Putin denying Ukraine's history and culture constituting an erasure. Um, and then this morning I was reading a New Yorker interview with Dmitry Muratov, who's the editor-in-chief of the independent Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta, and he's co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Um, he said they plan to publish the next issue in Ukrainian as well as Russian and discuss the difficulties of reporting on recent events. So speaking about government pressure on media, he stated, we received an order to ban the use of words war, occupation, invasion. However, we continue to call war, war. We are waiting for the consequences. And he said that they refuse to become propagandists. So the language being employed, the framing of the narratives being told will continue to impact how we understand these events as they unfold. And we need to approach it with a deeper awareness. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Julie, for your remarks. And thank you all for the opportunity to participate in this exceptional panel tonight. It's not far off the mark to say that as a student at Muhlenberg, I could not have imagined then of a time where I would join a faculty panel to, join, to discuss a major world event. So for the students online, this could be you in the future. I'm so delighted to be a part of the conversation. I'd also like to preface my remarks by sharing that they come not just from my 30 year FBI career, but from my deep experience working with and advocating for women globally, particularly women in conflict areas. In fact, I've been in daily contact with an exceptional Ukrainian woman in the past week who I had the pleasure and privilege to meet during a conference four years ago sponsored by Vital Voices Global Partnership. She's a former journalist, a human rights advocate and a diversity and inclusion strategist. She remains just outside of Kyiv, and she sent her children into the west of Ukraine to better protect them. She and I are in touch every day, getting updates, ensuring she's secure, and, and trying to give her guidance from afar, which is, which is a tough thing to do. In more than three decades of work in the national security, intelligence, and geopolitical space globally, there is one truism that has stood consistently. Russia will keep us in its crosshairs. I'd like to build upon some of the remarks shared by Mosin and provide some additional historical context as a practitioner um, coming from the FBI. I began my FBI career when the Cold War was still in full swing. I focused on the former Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, then Russia, from a counterintelligence perspective, and I worked very closely with our counterparts in the US intelligence community. I watched the events of Tiananmen Square in China unfold, and the Soviet Union disintegrate. This happened in a relatively, historically speaking, short period of time. I had thought neither possible. Following this, the US government and our Congress declared the Cold War was over and it was time to focus on exploding criminal problems with the crack and cocaine epidemics and horrifying levels of crime in our major cities. As has happened consistently in most of our lifetimes, the pendulum swung too far. Russia became a back burner issue for many, but not for the FBI, nor for the intelligence community writ large. Going back again to some of the time period that Mosin was speaking about, in the mid 1980s in the US, there was a spate of espionage investigations, 
involving US citizens who chose to spy for other governments. In fact, 1985 was called the year of the spy by Time Magazine, although arguably there were more espionage arrests in 1984. Although China, Cuba, and Israel were among the countries benefiting from US citizens willing to betray their country, sometimes for ideology, but often for money or ego, the then Soviet Union had by far the greatest numbers. The 1990s and early 2000s brought the incredible betrayals of former CIA officer, CIA officer Aldrich Ames and other employees of the US government who chose to spy for the Soviet Union in Russia. This culminated with the identification and arrest of former FBI agent Robert Hansen in February, 2001. I worked with Bob Hansen every day for more than three years. So his betrayal was personal as well as professional to me. The FBI had a team known as a squad in Washington, DC, and that still exists today, that focused on espionage cases and I had the privilege of leading it. Following the Cold War as one example, Germany opened its Stasi files. And for those who don't know, uh, the Stasi was the um, acronym for the, form, the intelligence service of the former East Germany. We received copious amounts of intelligence information from them. The intelligence information reflected independent operations by East Germany, but collaboration with the Soviet Union was evident. We also received information from Russian defectors over time, leading to more espionage cases, including in 1998, when the US successfully prosecuted and convicted a Department of Defense lawyer, a State Department employee, and a labor organizer who together had been spying since the mid 1970s, beginning when they were students at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. We understood how the Russians operated and we'd watched them do so very successfully for decades. The Russians are formidable, intelligent, and tenacious adversaries. One technique I'd like to see that we have seen the Russians use literally for decades and it's not changed. And I think this is an important point as you know, Mosin talked about things didn't just start or change with Putin, it's been in place. So one of these techniques um, is relevant as we watch the war in Ukraine unfold. And that is that the Russian government, specifically its intelligence services, the SVR and the GRU, as well as their predecessor organizations were and are masters at identifying, training and embedding their own people in foreign nations to do their building. These people are known as illegals or sleeper agents. This is a long-term effort reflecting an investment of years in developing both the background, the cover and the targeting focus of their agents. In brief, these individuals arrive in the US or other nations with false identities and names, often stolen from real but deceased people and are instructed to act and work as local nationals with the goal of penetrating the national security apparatus and obtaining classified and proprietary national security and economic information, or in the instance of Ukraine, fomenting an uprising or supporting an invasion. In a real world example, in June 2010, the FBI arrested 10 people as part of an investigation into a group of Russian illegals. The code name given was Ghost Stories. While many of you may not be familiar with the investigation, many of you will certainly be familiar with the TV series, The Americans, which is a fictional depiction of this story, but set earlier in time in the 1980s. And interestingly, the producers of that as they were developing thought, well, it wasn't right to make it happen now with Putin in charge and there were other dynamics and he thought it was much better to set it back in the 1980s, although it was reflective of what was happening in the 2000s and the 2010s. As we consider reporting today of Russia having embedded special forces operatives and others to work at undermining confidence and trust in the Ukrainian government, while I have no specific factual information to prove that, my more than three decades of experience tells me this is likely accurate. That is that they have sent people in. All of this is to reinforce the point that we can never take our eye off Russia. The decision to invade Ukraine last week, the decision to annex Crimea in 2014, and the decision to attack Georgia in 2008 were not spontaneous decisions. They were well thought out. Vladimir Putin, as Mosin has pointed out, has had a long simmering belief 
the, dis the disintegration, excuse me, disintegration of the Soviet Union was a mistake that needed to be rectified, and he believes he's the one to do it. Was it possible to disrupt his actions? I don't believe so. His demands, which were well enumerated, included actions that were never going to be accommodated by Europe, NATO, or the United States. His behavior, which can be consistently described as merciless, violent, and without morals, is exemplified by his willingness to kill and maim his adversaries. To be sure, not everyone who has challenged Putin has wound up dead or injured, but there are enough suspicious acts. There is no evidence to suggest he would or will adhere to international rules of engagement in conflict. Witnesses attacks today against clearly civilian targets in Kharkiv and what may have been the use of cluster munitions against civilians. This does not bode well for occupation of Ukraine by Russian forces if it happens. The manner in which this invasion has progressed thus far reflects mistakes and miscalculations. The failure to have a solid logistics plan, as we've seen with tanks and other vehicles running out of fuel, and the apparent but yet to be verified comments by Russian soldiers that they thought they were just engaging in training exercises in Belarus and suddenly were routed to Ukraine are examples. And just a few hours ago, I learned from a former CIA colleague that he heard from someone he trusted on the ground in Ukraine who advised that the Russian military was re relying on Google Maps and not their own GPS systems to navigate their movements. While we can't know what's in Putin's mind, I think many will agree that it hasn't gone as he envisioned thus far. Putin has created a completely unnecessary geopolitical and humanitarian crisis with significant economic and financial implications for much of the world, including the United States. And Vladimir Zelensky has shown us what real leadership under fire looks like. Many doubted his ability to lead his country, but his actions in the last six days dispel this. There's real concerns about the impact of war on Ukrainian citizens as Julie touched on, and not just from the actual attack by the Russian military. We're facing a huge humanitarian crisis of displaced Ukrainian citizens and their families, uh, more than 600,000 according to the UN as of now. Keep this in context when you consider that according to the United Nations at the end of 2020, there were 82.4 million forcibly displaced persons globally. Given the Taliban seizure of power in Afghanistan last August, compounded by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this number will only continue to grow. We know from every other conflict that this creates enormous danger for all, but for women and children in particular. Not only do they face the challenges of food and shelter, but the risk is very high for human trafficking and sexual violence, among other crimes. We cannot lose sight of this. As a final note, it's important that the focus be on Vladimir Putin, his leadership team, and the military, and that we not demonize the Russian people. Autocrats neither ask for nor heed the opinions or influence of others. The Russian people themselves may be part of the solution here. This may be the bridge too far for them. This may also present an opportunity to reach out to China or India to bring them into negotiations should they occur with Russia. Neither has decried the move by Putin, but rather than being angered by that, why not use it? Thank you very much. So thank you. First of all, um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, but also, I want to say that your questions are phenomenal that are coming into the chat, and there's so many of them. So I'm going to be really brief with uh, with my remarks and try to get to, to some of these questions, um, some of which might have been answered already. But um, I do want to uh, spend a little time um, with what I want to say, because I want to take us away from the specifics of the cases, maybe, and think about some bigger implications. And so I'm going to raise three points um, from the perspective of conflict and peace studies or international relations that speak less to the specifics of the event that we're I'm talking, I muted myself. Was I muted the whole time? Awesome. Uh, I was just saying that the questions that are coming out of the chat are fantastic. And that I'm gonna be really quick with, with my uh, comments here so we can get to as many of those questions as possible. And, um, and so, but I'm gonna re just three quick points 
that draw less from the specifics of the cases uh, of Ukraine and Russia and the war that's going on, and more to think about um, from the perspective of conflict and peace studies, some issues that, that have been on my mind. Um, uh, the first is uh, on sovereignty. Uh, this conflict raises a number of tricky concerns about sovereignty, which is a contested and critiqued concept that has nonetheless represented an important foundation of the post-World War II interstate peace. Article 2, Section 4 of the UN's Charter enshrined this principle of sovereignty. It states, quote, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations, end quote. And indeed, we've become much more accustomed to intrastate wars, um, civil wars, disintegration of states, failed states, insurgencies, etc., in the post-World War II era. This has been so much the case that Mary Caldor famously argued that we've left the era of old interstate wars behind and have entered into a new era of largely interstate new war, intrastate new wars. Yet the link between sovereignty and freedom that underpins this foundational UN principle uh, gets especially problematic for adjudicating different sovereign claims to the same territory. And Putin's arguments about Russian speakers, peoples in Ukraine, even his false claims of genocide along with his denials of Ukraine as a historical nation uh, that um, um, might make, uh, th when he makes those, that might make uh, recognizable claims of self-determination are designed to, or have the effect of, I think, muddying the waters. Um, claims to protect the sovereignty of some are being used to justify violations of the sovereignty of others. Um, on this point, I thought the Kenyan ambassador to the UN offered some profound thinking. Um, about the history of state borders and imperial collapse. And um, if you haven't seen it, it was in the debate on the eve that the war broke out, uh, February 21st, 2022. Um, go look for the Kenyan ambassador's remarks on this. Um, they were pro probably the most profound statement about, so about sovereignty and imperial collapse and ethnicities trapped on either side of borders, but the need not to go back, but to move forward that I've ever heard articulate. The second point that I've been thinking about is related to this, and it takes us from Baghdad to Kiev, from Benghazi to the Donbass. Um, and so the second point linked to the first is that we are now seeing the consequences of the steady erosion of the post-World War II order and respect for state sovereignty. But watching the Russian ambassador to the UN offer lies, fabrications, and half-truths as justification for Russia's unprovoked, non-defensive, and therefore unjust war brought to mind images of Secretary of State Colin Powell and CIA Director George Tenet before the same Security Council offering lies, fabrications, and half-truths as justifications for the U.S.'s unprovoked, non-defensive, and therefore unjust invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, in short, the Russian invasion of Ukraine undermines the principle of sovereignty, a guiding principle designed to promote interstate peace that had already lost its ability to constrain aggressive states' behavior, um, aggressive state behavior, especially when one of the key violators, one of the key aggressors, was the United States. This is not to suggest that sovereignty ought to trump all else. After the horrors of the Balkans and the Rwandan genocide, it became clear that sometimes the responsibility to protect justifies incursions on state sovereignty. Yet again, the invocation of this notion of a responsibility to protect by the West in the case of Libya is echoed though in the language of Putin and Lavrov um, as they've tried to uh, discuss Russia's military operations in Ukraine. So it's just a, that memory has been coming to my mind. And the third thing, the third point, and then we'll go to questions, is um, about uh, the problem of a post-war peace. Can you negotiate with war criminals? I'm struck by how difficult it is at the moment to see a path toward a peaceful resolution towards de-escalation, towards a just peace. At the end of this conflict, Putin will have, to, uh, will have been implicated in war crimes, uh, predicated on a series of lies and half-truths. There's a real danger in undermining the conditions for a just post-war period when any settlement would have to avoid either legitimizing the illegitimate claims used to justify and initiate this war, and reckon with a leader who may likely be implicated in war crimes, with the potential for greater crimes against humanity to come in the next few weeks. And so those are just some of the thoughts that I have. And, uh, but now we'll turn to some of the questions. So, uh, so thank you all. Uh, you've given us so much to think about, and there have been uh, many questions um, coming through in the chat, and I'm going to just uh, group a set of them, um, concern sanctions um, and expectations for their consequences, not just for Russia, um, but the economic consequences for the United States and for European countries. And so there, um, there's some interest in 
thinking about the efficacy of sanctions, what will they do, if anything, um, and um, how will um, the world in general cope with the consequences um, of, of these sanctions? And will they make a difference um, in Russia, potentially leading to the removal um, of Putin? Can I start? But I'm here to yeah. we'll follow up. All right. You know, there's a big literature on sanctions not working. I mean, uh, there, there, there's large data sets have been studied and all that. But having said that, uh, Russia, uh, Putin clearly thought that uh, he'll make him cushion himself and inoculate himself from any potential sanctions. He's looking at the past sanctions not being severe enough. Uh, he built up um, international reserve, uh, his windfall gains from uh, oil and gas, I think 635 or $645 billion. He had a national wealth fund, another $185 billion. He didn't imagine that holding them beyond the borders of Russia though they may be frozen. Right now, he can only access up to a third if he gets the Chinese ones, the yuan and the gold. So that severely diminishes him. He honestly didn't think the SWIFT would come into play. But we now know not just Mesh Economic Bank, the foreign, foreign trade bank, and the Russian Central Bank, right? And our, it's sovereign wealth. You know, uh, If you have invested in Russia's sovereign wealth, these are tough, tough times for you. Uh, so a lot of assets are being frozen. Uh, EU started immediately, even before us. UK, EU, I mean, every one of the Duma members who voted uh, to recognize, before even the invasion, the LPR and DPR, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, their overseas assets were frozen. The thing is, he thinks that Europe and the world can't survive without Russian energy. We know that, uh, uh, um, so much of European gas consumption, Germany being the prime case, you know, going away from nuclear, for example, and then bragging, we can buy anyone. You guys are, you, have, you guys have all commodified yourself, you de degenerate people, like Gerhard Schroeder being on his payroll, right? So we think in Italy also he has people. And uh, so he thought, but I think what this unified West is now doing, uh, it's showing a resolve that, you know, it might be a visceral reaction uh, because we're broken at the, you know, uh, the European unity is not there. Look at the type of people that are elected in Poland, in Hungary. Uh, these are illiberal people, right? Uh, so, so he was banking on these fractiousness, but he didn't see this kind of unified response coming in. Uh, Russia is ostracized. Uh, and again, Lauren, so important to say, let's not demonize all Russians. They are the first people who suffer. Right, uh, and sanctions usually go against. Saddam Hussein didn't, wasn't toppled by sanctions, but you know, we, we, we would see how Iraqi children suffered and all that. So I think it's gonna hurt him very much because you immediately saw the ruble devaluation. The stock market in one day lost one third of its value. Interest rates doubled from 9.5 to 20%. Inflation is gonna set in. Purchasing power is gonna go down. And so it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt Russians a lot, and and uh, and will this be the turning point uh, for the invincible Putin, who has, you know, left no scope for a, a opposition? Uh, but the, the, the stranger things have happened. Uh, stronger rulers have fallen, uh, and, and stranger people's movements have come. So I, I do think that he's played. That's why I call it such an irrational move. He he had everything at, in his fingertips. We were a mess. He had so much leverage in Ukraine and other parts. I let others talk. Um, I'd love to jump in if I can um, to add to what Mosin has said. First of all, there are a couple of differences this time um, around when we consider sanctions. First, um, the European Union and the US and Canada and others, including Japan, have made a decision to go after the oligarchs and to go after the people around him and their families and shutting their money down, shutting their ability to move. That's something if nothing else, that will have an impact. What that impact is going to be, I think, is very difficult to say right now. But that is unquestionably a different sort of pressure point that Putin, I don't think, um, saw coming, nor did his buddies. And, you know, a couple of them have spoken out now saying, oh, there should be peace. Well, that's easy to say when your billions are tied up in Switzerland and they've just said to you, stood up for in a rare occasion and said, you're not getting it. You can't fly here. 
Um, I think there's two other points I'd like to make. One, um, the impact of sanctions is going to have obviously an, in, um, an impact on all the countries who impose them, but there's going to also be a tremendous impact on Africa and the Middle East, and in particular, North Africa. They are already dealing with food and security issues in that part of the world, and so much of their grain and um, other commodities come from Ukraine and Russia. And so this is damaging them very significantly as a byproduct. And, and I don't even want to really want to use the byproduct because it um, suggests minimizing and I'm not doing that. I'm not trying to do that. The third point I want to make is that, that China, um, and we haven't really talked a whole lot about China and Russia. That's I think another conversation as well, but China, um, if they choose not to respect the sanctions and unless there's penalties affixed to those who don't respect the sanctions, or if there are export controls and they try and violate those. If they don't, China can be a source for Russia and trying to fill in the gap of what they're gonna lose from the West. So those are the three points I wanted to make. Just uh, Lauren, to say that's why I think it was important uh, uh, for Xi Jinping and Putin to meet. We still don't know what deals were struck there. And like you said, uh, I think 30% of the global wheat exports come from Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine al alone accounts for 15% of corn exports. So that will have a huge, I completely concur. Uh, and the uh, other thing I was joking, oh, sorry, uh, joking with my class that there was a report of these oligarchs moving their super yachts uh, to Maldives and elsewhere. I was telling my class I can park my super yacht anywhere now because the oligarchs have moved. There's plenty of room in the port. Plenty of room. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to, to pick up on this and then kind of um, um, sweep in a bunch of other questions that were kind of related to this as well. Um, and, and that is about whether or not uh, there'll be support for enduring these sanctions um, in the West and, and, and public support on this. Um, and, and so I'm not an Americanist and, um, and Lanithia, I don't know if you've looked at some of the polling on this. I've looked at it briefly. Snapshot polling is pretty quick, um, but I think it's, it's, it's yet to be determined um, how long you can sustain uh, US support for as robust a sanctions regime as they are, if it starts coupling or sort of um, aggravating the, the, the domestic political um, moment in the United States, which is already pretty concerned about inflation. And um, if this contributes to those rising levels of inflation, which is a definitely going to be a big wedge issue that the Republicans are going to um, run on in the midterm elections, um, then I can see this kind of undercutting some support, even, even though snap polling suggests um, um, majorities of both Democrats and Republicans um, are in favor of, of these uh, of these sanctions regimes. But I don't know, Julie, if you know um, about support for some of these things coming out of, uh, of Europe. Uh, I haven't been able to check out the latest there, but I know that there is a major concern, um, as I had mentioned, you know, the whole question of energy, right, with Germany trying to make this big shift and and having this plan in place that's now getting pushed, you know, they, that's why they held out for so long, right? They didn't want to, it's like, well, we'll, we'll we're not gonna make a, make a statement on that. Oh, we'll, we'll be okay. These are separate things until it came to that kind of breaking point of saying we have to do this. But then of course, then the concerns are the, the rising costs and the idea of, well, we had this goal set in mind for these, you know, for the environmental standards and how that's gonna be impacted as well. So I guess it'll just be a matter of time to see how those, how that, um, how that plays out. So I'm wondering if uh, I'm wondering how that does play out. Um, you know what uh, with these sanctions, uh, what is what is the anticipated end goal? Um, and do you, I guess I'm just having a hard time thinking of how this is supposed to play out. Um, will there be a point at which these sanctions are just lifted? Um, or is the lifting of those sanctions conditional on some outcome that is expected? Um, there are lots of questions in the chat about, what the sort of uh, the sense of the panelists uh, might be about expected outcomes um, and how we might see this coming to some kind of resolution. I know that the Putin's inner circle, I've read some material, they were banking on the fact that, you know, there is pandemic and inflation fatigue in, in Europe and the United States, that election cycles will, you know, necessitate that look look at Biden's numbers, right? The macroeconomic numbers are one, but his approval ratings, handling of the economy, inflation being a concern. And that's happening in like Boris Johnson's uh, UK and other parts too, right? So they think that they that, that we can't afford to do this. I mean, will Americans ever pay $10 a gallon for oil? You know, uh, I mean, our gluttony must be fueled somehow 
no pun intended, but uh, you know, we, we have pursued unsustainable patterns of consumption and production, right? I mean, we, we have caused so much damage, but it's a habit for our lifestyle. So how will that happen? We, I was reading something about that this generation has never lived above a 2% per annum inflation rate, and now they're dealing with 7% and it's disorienting them. Uh, so um, I don't know how long these sanctions can, how much um, uh, nuclear power does France have, because that's the nuclear power there energy-wise that it can give Germany, right? Because the other alternative is switch to coal. All this will take time, but imagine the climate disaster where we are at, that we contribute to. Uh, there's not I, 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 actually there's, given any report. There, there may be other alternatives before you get to there. Like there's a really good article, I think in, in, in one of the, uh, it was Forbes or Business Week, I forgot that I read yesterday about the possibility of, um, of exporting US style heat pumps to Germany. Um, and that you could run uh, heat pumps to the heat houses off of, uh, off of the electricity currently produced. And that would be a kind of an immediate switch over from the natural gas usage um, in, in heating as a kind of stopgap thing. So there's, I think there are, there are alternatives in between, but that, that, you know, that, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily answer the long-term question. I mean, like the Western governments um, have, a, have a, like if the longer this goes, the fewer off ramps there are for the, for the sanctions regimes, uh, and yet the more political costs they have at home, uh, and so there don't seem to be many off ramps for Putin, and there don't seem to be many off ramps for the the sanctions regime that's emerging right now. Um, and it's only we're only six days in, and so uh, um, things will get harder even even more. Um, on the on the topic of um, the role of the United States, um, there have been several questions about the previous presidential administrations. Um, actions um, in delaying aid to Ukraine and whether that was detrimental to the military defenses, um, uh, the aggrandizement of Putin uh, during the Trump administration. Um, and then I think similarly, some questions about um, the current moment with the Biden administration. And I do think, Brian, you alluded to the ways that I'm not sure it's, it's difficult to explain how this is cutting politically in the United States right now. So I guess I'm just wondering if anyone has any thoughts um, about an, any of those issues. Uh, my, my thought, my thought on the on the question of the delayed aid, um, um, which was the source of uh, of the first impeachment of, um, of President Trump, is, is that it probably didn't affect um, Ukraine's um, uh, preparedness for this particular um, conflict. Uh, in part because um, that aid had been um, sort of restored, and um, and the training of the of the uh, Ukrainian military had kind of begun um, going back towards uh, 2014 and even earlier. Um, and so, so I I think I think that it's probably less of a factor in. Um, I don't know if there was any more aid that was going to be forthcoming. Um, in, in other words. But. And, and Brian, onto that, I don't think that stopgap period would have radically altered the scenario. You could have doubled the aid to Ukraine. Uh, the disparities between Russian defense budget, what, $45 billion to 4.7 of Ukraine, uh, the active personnel of like less than 200,000 to a million and the reservists. You, uh, Putin, we mustn't forget, uh, doubled military expenditure between 2000 and 2014 and has kept it up. He's got, he's actually modernized his equipment, right? I don't understand military technology, but whatever fifth generation means, it apparently is much more, but look at how it's being deployed, how inefficiently, that's the other part, right? Um, and if this is going to become a civil war, blocked by like battle of Stalingrad kind of stuff in this day and age, Putin's in for something. You know, it's, it, it's a, even with a 40 mile convoy that's showing up, either he raises, uh, them down because air bombs are already there, as Lauren said, uh, cluster bomb or carpet bombing, whatever you call it. Uh, how does he recover from this, right? Uh, I'd also like to jump in too about whether it would have had an impact. Um, I would generally agree with Brian and Mosin on that, that I don't know it would have had a dramatic impact, but I do know from talking with um, friends and colleagues that prior to that event, there's been ongoing support provided by the United States, by the State Department, by the Department of Defense, by the Department of Justice. In fact, one of my former FBI friends just came back from Kiev. He had to leave because of what was going on. And he's been resident there working with the uh, law enforcement agencies and others. So that has been there where perhaps there was a difference. And I don't know, I am not a military expert, so I qualify it with that. 
but um, the Ukrainian air defenses are good and they've been able to, to fend off what has come in so far from Russia, but obviously not so well today in, in Kharkiv. But perhaps the supply of additional weaponry in that respect might have made a difference. The, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly Europe gets these weapons in, whether it's Germany, whether it's Sweden, whoever it is, how quickly they get that in. And you know, my fear is that it might not be, be soon enough. But I think it would be difficult to say definitively that this had a direct impact. It certainly didn't help things. but. There was a question um, back earlier about what types of weaponry we might be um, we might be providing, and if there was any heavy weaponry coming from um, the United States. And 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 I don't know about specific heavy weaponry. That, that I think the JD answered for the question. Um, uh, obviously, the the javelins, which are quite expensive, um, uh, make up a, a big portion of what we've been giving, and then surface to air missiles um, for 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 air defense. Um, it is very unusual to offer fighter jets. Um, my grad school colleague um, at the University of Kentucky, Rob Farley, has posted in two different places about thinking about like um, this, this notion that that, air, that um, NATO countries are supplying um, MiGs that um, Ukrainians can fly to, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, that gets really risky. Someone asked about if we've got the satellite imagery of this column, why isn't there a kind of an intervention to stop a humanitarian crisis when it occurs? I mean, that is sort of the essence of responsibility to protect, except for the escalation of this conflict into a global world war and the, the major you know, increase of risk of, 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 of nuclear war in, in that case. And I think that's an important point, Brian, because that, in my estimation from everybody that I know who's still currently in the government, that is what has played into it because there is no desire to wind up in a World War III situation. And the decision has been consciously made, and, and personally, I agree with it, by all the countries involved in laying out sanctions and encouraging Russia to stop what they're doing is because nobody wants that. It's why the US and NATO and Europe have consistently said NATO is a defensive organization. We are not going to take an offensive move. We're gonna prove you wrong. Now that could change. I mean, Putin's comments um, Sunday about putting his nuclear weaponry on higher alert. And a lot of people say they don't, they don't know exactly what that means, but certainly the threat is clear. You know, as his behavior becomes increasingly erratic, I think that's probably the one of the single biggest concerns right now within the intelligence communities in all of the countries involved is, is he really losing his mind? Is this just a different version of him? Because we're seeing conduct and things that he's saying, even his behavior, if you watch his physical, his body posture, how it's been in, in some of these public events, you know, that I think is the real wild card right now is we don't know what he's going to do. He kept, he was predictable up to a certain point in time, but a lot of what he's done recently has really made a lot of people question and, and be concerned. And that could be a game changer. I, can I just, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I just want to echo that, you know, I mean, because we for the longest time said that he is this pragmatic, cold-hearted, rational actor in his own way that plays a multi-layered chess game. He plays a weak hand tremendously well, but off late we've gotten reports and I, I can't read too much into that. And he's increasingly isolated and uh, he's becoming intolerant with his, uh, and his, his national security team is just an echo chamber where he's the only voice. I don't know if any of you saw, I think I shared with uh, Brian um, his, his uh, dressing down of Narishkin uh, the SVR chief, who's literally quivering and shaking. And uh, it was quite a scary kind of thing. I mean, you used to hear about Stalin, you know, in his paranoia behaving like that, but he seems isolated. And that could be a game changer. You want him to be stable. You don't want him to be irrational uh, with, with all the power that he possesses. Even oh, wait, this, is, yeah. this, this drives a home an important connection to another question that came up, which is about the connection between Russia and China. And I think it's really important to understand that these regimes are different um, and, and quite different. And the, the party state in, in China is a different form of authoritarianism than the personalism that you see in, in Russia. And, um, and so even if there is um, um, alignment around the, um, evading a sanctions regime or economic ties to them, um, the behavior is, is quite different, um, even if Xi Jinping is in, in, um, in charge. There was, we had a, 
uh, a conversation a couple weeks ago with one of the great decisions of foreign affairs programs in Lehigh Valley, where um, um, someone from the Army um, War College um, was talking and saying that, look, if Xi Jinping um, you know, had a heart attack and died tomorrow, the Chinese um, apparatus would keep functioning. But if Putin passes away, there is no clear line of succession. There is, is, is really unclear what takes over. And so they're, they're quite different types of authoritarianism. Because the Medvedev trial didn't work out. Right. I'm, I'm wondering if any of you have um, thoughts about not just the sort of nuclear threat, but um, cyber um, warfare. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure, Lauren, that you have some experience that you can share on this question, but some of our audience members have asked questions about it as well. Um, and uh, sort of the, the sort of decision-making calculus around, around that and intelligence around cyber warfare. Yeah, cyber attacks are, are very real, they're ongoing. Um, I saw a statistic that for 2021, 70% of the ransomware attacks that occurred went back to somebody in Russia. And I say somebody in a generic sense, but Russian government, Russian private sector, Russian hackers. So they are very aggressive out there. The Chinese are aggressive, the North Koreans are, the Iranians are. Um, but this is something to be very alert with. Now, the US government, and I'll, I will find the resources and put them in the chat, but the US government has put up what they call the Shields Up Alert, which goes out, it's accessible to the entire public, and it encourages infrastructure components as well as the private sector to take certain steps, which they enumerate in this document that was released uh, late, uh, last week. Um, concrete steps that people can take, and that includes steps that individuals can take. So it's very real. They have already made efforts and, and successfully tapped into um, parts of the electrical grid. Um, the Iranians have also uh, tapped into the electrical grid and the water supply in New York going back quite a few years. Now, they haven't done anything besides do those probes when it came to um, trying to attack infrastructure, but that's something really important to keep in mind. But what you should all have trust and confidence in, and I realize I'm saying that in a time where I think the biggest problem in our country is a trust deficit um, of each other and of institutions. And that is that our government from a defensive and an offensive standpoint does a superb job in the cyber arena. And I can promise you, although I don't know specifics, that the Department of Defense, along with the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Agency, the FBI, CIA, everybody is bringing all that they have to bear in this. And that includes, as I said, from a defensive posture, as well as evaluating what steps they might take in an offensive respect. I just want to echo uh, what Lauren is saying. We've actually even identified specific buildings in St. Petersburg where these hackers are working and, and, and they're, they're part of their SVR and uh, I forget what the other organization, FOPC or something like that, uh, from internet control to the hype. But their chief of general staff, his last name's Gerasimov. Uh, and the Gerasimov doctrine is, you know, about hybrid warfare. And my, my interest in this is, can we use it against them? Or do we intend to, like, as in Stuxnet that we did with the Iranians, right? That put their system back quite a... So it's not like that, we're, uh, do we have any congressional binding mandates that we cannot use it against them to weaken other regimes? Uh, Lauren, do you know? Yeah, Mike. Mike. Uh, my apologies, could you repeat that? I was just looking for some links to toss oh, up here. I was saying, does the reverse hold any play that us using cyber warfare because of our information architecture is should be superior against Russia, like, like Stuxnet and Iran. Yep, yep. And, and that's a question I can guarantee you that's under discussion right now in the Department of Defense. I, don't, I am not privy to the details of it, but I can guarantee you based on the conversations I have with the people I am working with within the Department of Defense and cert with certain contractors, that that is very much on the table and they're gonna have tripwires as they would with every sort of, um, offensive action that they will take before they will do that. But they are certainly doing things in support of Ukraine. There is an effort beyond the, the hard weaponry to support Ukraine in the cyber world as well. They've got good capabilities in Ukraine, but it's important that they get that support. So I, I can be sure, I think safely say to everybody that 
that is another area where Ukraine is getting support that might not be visible, but is ongoing. I will just say to um, our, our guest here from Istanbul, Hoshka Adriz, um, welcome to the discussion. Turkey is fascinating in, in this moment in time, with the uh, you know, treaties and controls of the, of the canal. So um, if there's any interest we can get in there. But Julie, I have a question that, that I'm gonna try to um, uh, uh, lump everybody in, but maybe I'm not sure you want to, but people were asking about this uh, question about Nazis and denazification and that rhetoric that, that Putin is, is using. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you have any, any thoughts about that, that, that particular historical referent, um, the, 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 the rhetoric of denazification of the regime, um, I have some thoughts on, but um, I don't know if you have any. You can go ahead first, Brian, since you have your thoughts first, while I think yeah. of my own thoughts and set the, yeah. that question up. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those. This is one of those places to me where I identify the half truths with it or the tiny nugget of reality. So, um, as in many countries in Europe, you have a, um, a, a sort of a semi-political, semi-militarized neo-Nazi element within the Ukrainian political system. Um, they do not represent the regime. They are not within political power within the in the system. But um, but that I think that fact of a neo-Nazi presence becomes part of the story that is being told. It's like you know we seize our Qawi in Iraq, uh, therefore we can establish a, co a connection between Iraq and Al Qaeda. True, he was there in northern Iraq. We had you know um, uh, CIA observations of, of him there before he became something. Right, we knew that he had gone to Afghanistan to meet with the Mon. Anyway, so that nugget of truth is part of that story. Um, but there's certainly there's certainly a, a bigger rhetoric around it that might be that might be drawing on a World War II history and, and, and appealing more to the Russian population too. Um, let's see. So th kind of think through. Um, right away, we talk about right the the, the neo Nazis um, that we've been talking about that within my classes as well when we're talking about these immigration right because they're not unfortunately they are gaining power in Germany right that the the the, the alternative for Deutschland, the AfD, the, the, um, the alternatives for Germany are gaining seats, they're gaining power. So it is a small part and they don't speak for everybody, right? If they go out to their rally, you've got more folks protesting against them than, than, are, than are there, but that it's a, it's a strong voice. They use, they use violence as I had referred to in those examples. Um, so that's what gains kind of, um, it's, it's amplified in those, in those means as well, um, but yeah, that the this ties back to the energy as well, right? Um, so I was reading recently when we talk about the reason to get away from using coal, right, where we're pushing for cleaner energy, but in some of those in um, in some of those areas where coal has been so much of their identity, where they are for so long, that is, you know, so they're um, resisting those changes. We've got pushback. Um, we've got, um, so not quite sure <laughs> tying it all together, but yes, we do have those pockets there. We do have those um, and that it kind of puts barriers in that, that progress that they're, that they're making and it allows that space to open up that, that discourse and to make those, those okay. accusations. Yeah, Mohsen, do you wanna add to yeah, that? Just in the, in, the, in the context of Ukraine though, I mean, the small but loud group, as you know, uh, they have been threatening Zelensky, right? That if you negotiate with the Luhansk people and as per the Minsk agreement, your head will be up there, right? On a, on a state. Uh, so the, the, they are vocal. Um, and that's the problem with nationalism. When it's ethno-nationalism, uh, whether it was earlier on, the Ruch movement in the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were elements in Ukrainian nationalism then too that were for us, problematic, right? I mean, uh, the AVD, for example, is more than problematic in many, many uh, ways, but that's a reaction to Angela Merkel's posture too, right? Regarding to be so humane uh, as a conservative, as I remind my students that you, you realize she's a, a CDU person, right? So, uh, but then again, invoking the World War II thing, that, that's the big thing, their victory over Nazi Germany as like, you know, allied forces had a very minimal part, uh, 20 million lives lost. They didn't want to talk and Putin doesn't want to talk how many were killed by Stalin, right? I mean, uh, even during World War II, but it's that picture on top of Reichstag, the Soviet flag, right? And, and a, 
assumption of superpower status. So denazification is this historical noble role, but it's code word for other things that they also say demilitarization, right? So it's that whole thing. Ukraine is not a real country. Uh, it's part of that. I, I was gonna uh, circle back um, to ask a couple of questions about um, the humanitarian crisis and uh, the refugee situation. And I guess I'm sort of um, wondering if, if you all see the response to this situation moving in a more liberal or illiberal direction. Um, this, I think, gets back to some of Brian's comments about tensions over state sovereignty. So um, I don't have a representative sample, but there seems to be broad uh, public support um, for Ukraine, um, lots of interest in supporting refugees. Um, and uh, you, you talked, um, Julie, about how complicated um, that really is. Will this lead to um, change in our thinking about international human rights, or will it reify uh, the way we think about state sovereignty? Are we going to move in a liberal direction or an illiberal direction? And I, I can tell by your faces that you're not optimistic about the liberal direction from, from some of you, but maybe you could comment. Julie, do you want to go first? Um, well, thank you. I, I think it could go in either direction. I mean, in the past, right, we, when, the, when we have this conflict, we see we're watching this play out and people are supportive. We want to reach out. We want to help. And as we point out, well, when things start, when, you know, when prices go up, when things start getting, you know, stretched to the limits, will that fade? And we saw that happen as well, right? I mean, um, most in point out with Miracle, right? At first, the policies, the Vilcomen's culture, right? Come on in. But then even those that were supportive at first and welcoming the, the, the refugees at the train stations, it was starting to wear thin and you see that support dying out. Um, the question becomes, is it due to the groups of who, who is who you are welcoming, will we see a shift this time because of the identities of these refugees? So it could go in either direction, but the economic repercussions could, you know, put that that pressure there that the the enthusiasm for this support might might be stretched then. That's so I could see it going either way. So I'm interested to hear what what you think as well. I think that and as much as this pains me to say it is the reality, I think that the reason they have been so accepting so far and welcoming the Ukrainians is because they look like us, they look like them. And it's really disheartening. It's disheartening and disturbing to hear the stories of Africans and Indian nationals who are students trying to get out and being tossed to the back of the line at the border. I mean, that is not helpful. And you've got Russia and Belarus who essentially weaponized refugees before this invasion started, which was despicable beyond belief. And to use these people as tools, which is what was happening there, is still happening there, <clears throat> is reprehensible. I mean, I would love to be optimistic. I am by nature very optimistic and, and would love to see that maybe this makes a change, but even some of the comments of people, public figures who have said, oh, well, you know, they're well-educated, they're all this. People have no idea the level of education coming out of other places where people are refugees. I did a tremendous amount of work with the um, community, the, as they call them, the new Mainer community in the Portland, Maine area where I had a home uh, over several years. And the kinds of backgrounds that these folks had were just extraordinary. We had judges from Iraq, we had lawyers from Afghanistan, we had doctors from the Congo. And everybody looks at them and they, make, they ask questions like, well, gee, why are they coming with a cell phone? Well, gee, do you have a cell phone? I mean, it's just, it's absurd. And I would love to see us embrace the fact that everybody has a story. Nobody, nobody voluntarily walks away from their home with nothing but a bag or a backpack and dragging their kids and maybe holding the kid's stuffed animal and, and the pet cat. I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so disturbing to me, but I would love to see this be a change. I would love to see, for example, those fleeing Ukraine then start being that voice to say to the others that have already come before them into these into these countries in Europe, you know, let's work together, let's let's help each other. I think there's potential and there's great opportunity for that, and I would love to see that happen. Yeah, I, I, I would just sort of echo all that and, and say that um, uh, that one one failure we have here is of of the kind of economic element of liberal internationalism. Um, and even though I don't think anyone would describe um, Russia as a liberal country, 
um, clearly, as we see, they were highly integrated into the, um, the liberal um, e global economy, right? Um, um, not just through gas, but also through finance and all kinds of other things. Um, and that did not curb their state behavior. And so if anything, we need to understand that the need to strengthen the sort of political project of liberalism um, in, in response to these kinds of things. But, um, but I do worry that sitting out there still, even though we're distracted a little bit by this situation right now, is the major sort of illiberal rise of populism that we see all throughout the West. It's true in Poland, it's true in Hungary, it's true in France, it's like it's true in the United States. Like we're like, this is a major force uh, that's still there. It's not gonna disappear just because Russia invaded uh, um, Ukraine. Um, and, the, and the danger I think is that not that they will become Putin, but Putin's version of a kind of um, robust populist um, nationalist politics, that is, not, that is not a far cry from the, the kind of um, populism that we see operating in, in the, um, in the liberal and democratic world. And maybe it explains Tucker Carlson's attraction to Putin too. Tucker came up in the, uh, in the questions a minute ago. <clears throat> um, oh, go ahead, Brian. Uh, no, I, I, I wanted to actually, because I don't want to be to totally depressing, um, I wanted to return to a question that came up earlier about um, like, what do we make of, um, of the idea of some, of some potential Russian soldiers refusing to fight, right? Um, and I want to actually pose two things that come out of here um, that I think are, uh, are the things that I am most hopeful about in this moment. One is um, the, the incredible uh, power of nonviolence, um, the, uh, the bravery of these um, people who just are walking up to tanks and stopping and stopping tanks unarmed. Um, that sort of like meeting of violence with 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 nonviolence and a and um, functioning in a kind of way that that um, humanizes you and makes it more difficult probably to to just kill you indiscriminately, um, which is why you bombard from the air so that you don't have that kind of human interaction. Um, but also then the the potential refusal to fight. There there seems to be these, these brief moments um, that need to be held up uh, in the midst of all this conflict and kind of focusing on that as an alternative. So I don't know. If There's some reports of Russian soldiers switching sides, fighting for Ukraine, uh, that too. But I was recently reading the eight people in 1968 who went to Red Square to protest the Prague Spring, that, that invasion after the Prague Spring. In spite of that, there's always hope uh, in terms of that. But on the, on the downside, Julie, you'll remember after reunification how quickly the old statement slogan of like two, uh, well, one people, two states became one state, two people, the Aussies, right? Uh, so there was even in the Germanic thing, uh, a kind of you're nothing but a liability. But I think there's enough um, for this Zelensky, take him for example, he's now this heroic figure with 20% approval ratings just three weeks ago. Every Ukrainian, post-Soviet Ukrainian leader, whether it's like I said, a Moscow stooge or the liberal, abysmal on the governance, right? And here where uh, they're doing that at a 91% rating, right? I know it's under crisis mode. Um, or, or, or the hope of people like Angela Merkel, right? Even if it gives rise to IF Day, but what lessons and hope it leaves for our common humanity. And I was thinking in this initial question, Lenithia, I mean, the, I think we all read Sheila Ben Habib's kind of concepts of territoriality. Uh, and 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 you know, notions of all states, you know, in some respect, Mexico could make some claims for getting parts of their land back. Uh, you know, I mean, these states are artificial creations, right? And they are redrawn. Czechoslovakia are two countries, and U USSR being fifteen different countries, and uh, the Kenyan ambassador bringing up these colonial straight lines. Uh, these are bigger problems, but I think. Brian, you hit it on the money that we need to take care of liberalism at home. I mean, democracy's relationship with markets at home, until we fix that, uh, the Orbans will keep coming up. Not everyone will have nukes, but the Modis will come, the Erdogans will come, right? And, and that's a crisis of liberalism in, in, in certain ways. Uh, it's a broader question. And I bet Putin is banking on that, this kind of, he doesn't create the polarization, he foments and exacerbates, right? Um, I'd like to jump in and propose something a little bit unusual. Um, there's a friend of mine, it's the woman that's on there from Turkey. She's watching and it's the middle of the night, which I love. If it, um, I realize we can't get her to speak here, but I'm wondering we, we um, if, it, if you can put some comments in the chat box about what you see 
as somebody living in Turkey about how this is playing out there, because I think Turkey's role is really important here. And we really, there's been a few questions about that. Sorry, I'm hijacking you, Lanithia, on that, but but I think it's important to, to touch on that. Brian? We can allow her to talk if she wants to. Um, okay, if she's willing to. Um, I guess she's still on there. I sent her a message before. If I'm in, still there, we can unmute you. In, in, in the... Um, in the in the meantime, I, I will just say in, in relation to to Turkey, how fascinating all of this is as Turkey navigates its relationship between the United States and, and Russia, having having purchased these air uh, defense missiles um, from Russia, having made it a pariah within NATO, to sort of um, being in, in in agreement, increasing in agreement with the uh, with the isolation of Russia, to the invocation of the Montreux Treaty to try to cut cut down warships that might be coming through the um, the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus to, to, to contribute to the war effort. Um, very complex um, stuff. Um, it is, doesn't go unnoticed to me that um, that Turkey is also using this as a moment to engage in some counterterrorism operations in the Southeast as well, um, particularly against uh, organizations like um, the alleged Fetch of the Gudan terrorist organization, which may or may not be a, a terrorist organization, depending on your, your politics and how you define things and people's relationship to a foiled coup. But, um, so I'm just um, just taking a peek at the clock, and I think we want to try to wrap up um, within the next few minutes. Um, I know that um, many of us are um, planning to watch uh, President Biden's State of the Union address, where I'm sure that um, this topic will be uh, a part of that. But I, I wanted to um, to give all of the panelists an opportunity just to offer any sort of final thoughts um, or um, points that maybe we haven't had an opportunity to cover. Um, I, I didn't prepare you for this, so it's okay if, if you feel like we've already covered everything, but I realize that um, that maybe some of the points you were hoping to get across, maybe we haven't we haven't covered yet. Thanks, Lanithia. I guess the one thing that I would say is I would ask that we all look at what's happening right now as an opportunity. It's horrible what's happening to the Ukrainians. I in no way intend to minimize that. But much like the pandemic was something everybody experienced, to me, that was a missed opportunity to come together on certain things and call that the idealist in me and the forever hopeful and optimistic. But as was said earlier, maybe this is something in the United States that allows us to largely, never completely, unite around one thing. And maybe that can start us moving towards better conversations among ourselves with everybody, whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's our politicians, whoever it is, because if things keep going the way they've been here, it's not gonna be good. And Ukraine in essence, and I don't, again, I'm not minimizing it, is a distraction for now, but every one of those problems is still deeply embedded here in this country. And as the sanctions start economically impacting Americans, and that will happen, not only at the gas pump, but it will happen, you know, we should find a way to make this a, a point of unity and not another point of division and divisiveness and hatred. So it's my plea to everybody online to do one step, do that with one person in your life that you don't agree with. And you know, let's all try and use this as a unifying message to go forward together and try and improve how things are right here in the United States. Thank you for that, Lauren. I was gonna say, I'm also known as an overly optimist, uh, optimistic or idealistic person in some of these ways, but exactly that, right? We've seen so many being pushed to the breaking point of being able to look away or say, we're gonna distance ourselves in the past. And this has been a turning point. This has been the last straw for many that are speaking up and hoping that more unity comes out of it, more the idea of this, not just looking away or going back to normal, but really using this as a chance to move forward in a better way. And also, uh, again, pointing out the issues of inequality, right, that in a way that addresses everybody's needs and not just specific groups, more privileged groups, but thinking about how it's affecting marginalized communities as well and finding solutions that help everybody and not just um, just some folks. I just piggyback on that, that if this is not the clarion or last call for us to try to figure out better ways of governance domestically and internationally, and, uh, you know, this is, this may be our last chance. So that should excite us instead of, you know, throw us into despondency. It's a, it's a, you know, call to, you know, uh, to, to, to understand 
where are the boundaries between local, national, and global citizenship? And this is the time. This really is the time to really understand. And we often under, don't even understand our footprint, right? I mean, from carbon footprint to moral footprint as the, such a powerful country, make things election issues, you know, even if it's happening in Angola, even if it's happening in Ukraine, um, be invested in your communities and your, in your political system. That's it. Brian, did you have a final comment? Okay, so um, so I, I just wanted to to thank our panelists again um, for um, their time um, and sharing their their expertise um, with us. And um, I know that there were some resources um, and some references to things that were shared in the chat. And I will uh, do my best to put those um, link those to uh, the video recording of this program when we post it on Muhlenberg's website tomorrow. Um, and so um, I'll hope to send that out an, an email link, but I'm going to um, just put my email address in the chat um, in the event that you're unable to find the recording um, or you have any follow-up questions. And uh, to thank you all um, for a, a great discussion this evening.